After putting on a large furry vest and draping myself with plastic vines, I went over to where Hergil, Lith, Valen and Rend were waiting. The others were similarly dressed like trolls, except Valen was dressed in odd robes and had a bushy white beard. Valen explained he'd be going to the inn as a wizard NPC to get people to go out and he'd try gathering information there as well. He also said that bog trolls were solitary creatures but would rush over if heard any other bog troll roar. I was then handed a copper piece and we all headed out in different directions. I was back. My shoes gripped the ground perfectly, launching me forward into the forest with admittedly untroll like speed. I'll admit it now, though I hope you won't go around telling anyone, but after the last event, some of the motivation for me to work out came in from the smallest seed of desire to come back here. While Lith had only really tried to train himself over the last month, I had been improving my condition for the last several, running just to see how quickly I could charge through the patches of forest and the occasional open field. I was surprised to see just how much of the place I remembered. I occasionally saw a group of three or four people, but I ignored them, and none seemed intent on trying to fight a monster who was willing to attract attention to himself. I had two missions right now, though the first was just to see what had changed in the last few months. The second, which I considered much more important, was to find Ulsic's crew and to see just how well they fought. From Valen's accounts, they weren't simply good. Though it had been their first event, they had managed to easily defeat people who had much stronger characters and had proven to know how to use small-scale tactics pretty well. This isn't what made them scary, Valen had said, though it definitely made them threatening. What made them scary was that they managed to hunt down eight members of House Cerberus several times. In order for a character to be permanently killed, they had to die a certain amount of times, which decreased with what level the character was. A first level character could die 20 times, a fifth level one only had 15 deaths, and 20th and higher level characters could die permanently if they died once. House Cerberus had, outside of Hargill, only low level players in it which meant they were killed time and time again until they abandoned the house or were simply permanently killed. To catch a person who didn't want to be caught in huge campgrounds wasn't easy, and the fact that they had done so reliably made me wonder what kind of skills they had outside of being able to fight. With a good part of the half-formed plan I was creating, relying on being able to fight them on our terms instead of theirs, I needed to know what they were capable of. While running, trapped in my thoughts, I was abruptly sprung from them when I heard a roar from a good distance away. I stopped, listened hard, until I heard it again. Though I was still not sure who it was that was roaring, I ran in the direction it came from, leaping over stumps and bushes that might have given trouble to me before. I reached a small clearing and was shocked to see Rand lying on the ground with two armoured men standing over him. One was wearing thick, detailed and shiny plate armour that didn't seem to restrain him at all and he was carrying a long pole arm that ended with a hammer at its hip, a beck to Corbin. The other wore black leather scale cloth with thick pads on his shoulders, elbows and knees, and had a simple yet very high quality two-handed foam sword. I recognised these two, and would have been more than eager to fight them if I hadn't seen Rand on the ground. I had made too much noise for them not to have noticed me, but they were content to continue talking amongst themselves over Rand. Cautiously, I stepped into the clearing, and the two of them finished their discussion, with the hammer wielder remaining where he was while the other stepped towards me. He didn't ask me what I was, and I doubt he would have cared even if I told him I was a five-year-old princess. He wanted to fight me just as much as I wanted to fight him, and this was the perfect chance for both of us to see how we measured up to each other. I swung first, a deliberately short strike just to see how he'd react. He didn't miss the opportunity. Flashing out his sword and catching the tip of mine, he took advantage of my surprise, and as I pulled my sword back out of his reach, he stepped forward, cutting in for 8 points of damage. Before my mind even registered the number, he hit me twice in rapid succession before I managed to back up out of his way. He didn't let me. Sticking close to me, matching my movement, he continued to land strikes on me until I dropped with the fifth hit. As I sank to the ground, he gave me a look of disappointment before turning back to his ally. Lying on the ground, I tried to figure out what had just happened. At first I thought about the 8 damage he was dealing. Ordinarily, a first level character, like Nephim, only dealt 4 points of damage with a two-handed sword, 
or 5 if he sank most of his skill points into increasing that damage. But for this guy to be dealing 8 meant that he was using magic items, and rather powerful ones. After I made this conclusion, I felt a little ashamed because I knew I was looking for excuses to try and avoid what just had happened. He had beat me before I had even landed a single hit. How much damage was he dealing didn't mean anything if I couldn't even hit him once, and I slowly realised that I hadn't even blocked any of his attacks. He had beaten me completely in near equal terms, and I didn't even know how strong he was compared to the rest of this group. They left after a minute or so, not even bothering to search us for the copper pieces we had, and Ren sat up after three minutes of silence. I'm sure there was something he wanted to say to me, but we just got up and headed back to the cave, the scene all too visibly emblazoned on our minds. Only once I sat down on one of the couches in the cave did all the frustration I was supposed to be feeling hit me. Who the hell were those guys? How were they so good? Up until then, my half-formed plan was to kill them, and then I thought the hard part would be taking down Ulsic. Having now fought one of his lackeys, I started to think it might be easier to take down the undead version of the strongest player in the game, rather than face those seven. Still wallowing in my defeat, I waited in silence until Lith and Harjul returned, each of them looking enraged. They began to curse at Ulsic for having brought those seven. They had been soundly defeated, just as Rand and I had been, and it had been barely half an hour since we had gone out. The two of them kept discussing how they were far too strong for first level characters while well, Rand and I kept silent, thinking about the battle. Was there any chance of getting through this event with Nephim alive? Maybe I just had to spend the rest of the weekend as a monster. I should have felt ashamed, but my brain was too overloaded to be concerned about that. I had come with the idea that Hergil, Lith, Rand and Valon, and I, would be more than enough to take down Ulsic and whatever pathetic followers he had gripped together. I'd even had visions of pitched battles pushing me to the limits of my abilities, but I would always come out on top. Now I needed to figure out how to keep House Cerberus from crumbling while I felt there was nothing I could do. When Valen returned, he didn't return with good news. He had asked people for the full story of Ulsic, and I realised just how unpleasant the weekend was going to be. Ulsic had returned as a lich, but a good lich. He had been brought back to life by a group of ten people in a ritual. He had saved the entire town in an important battle almost single-handedly. After his resurrection, he sought to destroy the evil houses that had assassinated him, while restoring his own house, House Ulsic. With this is the story. It now didn't seem so odd that most of the other players weren't too happy with us. When I asked who the ten people were, Valen said it was the seven new players, along with three old members of House Ulsic. One I didn't know, but the other two I remembered well. One had been a fat woman who had tried to convince everyone that I had killed her because I was late in saving her, while the other was miserable two-handed sword wielder who had killed twice, once by killing him in his sleep and the second time on the field of battle. When I told him I was certain that these two had permanently died at last event, Valen explained that they were playing secondary characters, each nearly identical to their old ones. I let this all sink in. Not only were we fighting against Ulsic, we were fighting against popular opinion. It had been my hope that I could get a fair amount of players to rally behind us to kill the lich, but him managing to produce some bullshit about being a good lich who only wanted to help people to have revenge against his killers was just too much. Still, something didn't sit right. Why go through the trouble of being a lich? Why not simply be restored to life as he had been? Why bother coming back as an undead? Knowing him, He'd considered being an undead a painful reminder that he had been killed, and he wouldn't have settled for that if he could have helped it. Slowly, a potential ally started to appear in my mind. Ulsic, while being a plot master, was not the only one. The other two plot masters must have restricted him from being simply resurrected, and he had to be content with coming back as a lich. While I'm certain that Ulsic would have had no problem bending the rules about permanent death just to save his character, the other two plot masters had at least enough sense to stop him from revising his own death. I didn't know how useful this idea might have been, but at least kept me sane, since I at least knew that Ulsic wasn't in complete control. He was powerful, yes, but not omnipotent, which at least gave us a chance. I didn't share these thoughts with the rest of my crew, because it really did feel like I was grasping at trivial things while we had much larger problems to tackle. Realising just how pathetic I was starting to sound, even to myself, 
I decided that sitting around wasn't going to help us at all. Just as I stood up, the group of new people arrived at the cave, chatting loudly. The old man smiled as he explained to them just how to get assignments from the other monsters and that tomorrow they'd be playing as their characters. But his face fell into a grimace when he had finished, obviously upset about something. The monster leader left the cave, moving like he had some urgent business. Most of the new players seemed angry about something, slumping down into the couches grumpily. But the group of goth girls were looking around for something. They spotted me standing, and the tallest of them, with long bleached white hair but somewhat unflattering wide face, asked me to give them an assignment. I asked Fallon what to do, and he said to lead them over towards the record room where one of the veteran monsters usually was. After showing them a room with a large desk and a number of cabinets, the guy inside decided to ask me to act as their leader and that we'd be going out as skeleton knights. Once we got back to the main room, Valen explained the costume to me and the five girls and we quickly dressed in bone pattern robes with black cloth masks and picked up a variety of weapons. Sadly, skeleton knights couldn't use two-handed weapons, so I grabbed two swords instead. Just before we left, the old yet new player came hobbling over, saying that he had been assigned to go with us. After waiting the five minutes it took for him to get ready, the seven of us set off. In truth, I had wanted to go out alone and explore more of the campgrounds, but with these people as potential allies, I sought to be as friendly and as helpful as I could be. I might have been a little overly nice at first, and the way the girls returned smiles that they were just too happy for my taste curbed my enthusiasm rather quickly. While skeleton knights were usually supposed to be silent, three teenage girls were asking questions after questions, most of them not at all related to the game. The tall girl in particular had a habit of asking questions that worried me, like my thoughts in the afterlife and whether I believed in real magic. Reminding myself that I might need her help later, I answered her questions vaguely, knowing that I didn't want to be wrangled into a conversation about life and death with a teenager who seemed obsessed with the latter. The old man made her journey last far longer than I would have liked, but I couldn't blame him. When I grew tired of the girl's immense interest in an older guy who lacked the proper sense to tell him to be quiet, I would hang back and chat with him. He had come to this LARP because he wanted to spend time with his grandson, but his grandson had a monster shift on Sunday. He was a little depressed that his grandson had not decided to take two monster shifts so that they could stay together. But he hadn't come here so that he would be a nuisance to them. Eventually, we spotted a group of three players, none of which seemed particularly strong. Skeleton knights also weren't too great in regards to stats, but we outnumbered them by a fair bit. The girls stood still, looking towards me for directions. I merely nodded before I raced forward. The three players saw six of us, and two seemed intent on running away. One, however, remained, calling back to his allies to stay and fight. This one lunged forward at me, with a sword in one hand and a dagger in the other. It felt good. I didn't even bother attacking him for a good long time, savouring the feeling of being able to block and react to his strikes with ease. He was a player one of the unathletic, unskilled, undisciplined combatants that was so bad that he probably thought he had the advantage since I wasn't returning his attacks. After the other two players had moved forward, he began to fight against the girls, who had moved to surround them. I began a simple pattern of blocking and striking. I would never have fallen into such an obvious pattern if I was fighting someone I considered a threat, but he was unable to break the rhythm, getting hit each time he tried to attack and he kept trying to attack. When I finally dropped him, two of the girls were also sitting down in the ground, and I rushed over towards my next opponent. After dropping him in seconds, thanks to the aid of the two remaining girls, I checked to see if the last of our opponents had enough sense to run. He did, and as he sprinted away at full speed, I motioned for the girls not to follow him. When we had put some distance between us and the fallen players, I told him it was only courteous to give him a chance to run back to the inn and get some healers to save his friends. The two girls who had been killed seemed a little depressed, but the rest were rather pleased with themselves. Even the old man looked rather happy, just to have survived, though he hadn't even gotten close to any of the players. The girls seemed rather impressed with how I fought, and they even badgered me for lessons for a few minutes. After I gave in and started to explain things to them far more seriously than I should have, they quickly lost interest. We continued on, following a mental path I made that would give me a good chance to see all of the grounds, and I saw something I knew had not been there the last time I had been here. I first was simply dumbfounded, 
because I thought I was staring at a real castle that must have been built in the few months I had been gone. Upon closer inspection, I realised it was mostly made out of painted plywood and had a very amateurish construction, more of a giant playground fixture than a real building. Even so, I was impressed, and as I was admiring it, a tall man emerged from one of the few entrances, a fellow monster. He greeted us out of character, and after I explained it was our first time seeing the place, he invited us inside to look around. The interior was mostly bare, though some of the walls had been roughly painted to look like stone. It was rather dark, with only a few battery-powered lights that dimly lit the passages. I was surprised at the sheer size of the thing, though as we explored further into it, we saw that most of the rooms were just wall patches of dirt without roofs or floors. The layout was almost maze-like, and without our guide we could have easily gotten lost inside. He explained that the core of the castle had been built by a legitimate construction crew, that the extended additions had been made by a group of volunteer players, which included himself. They had only used it once so far, two events ago, but it was still open for any brave adventurer to come in and try and find some of the treasure that was hidden inside. Of course, they'd have to fight him, and if they beat him, he'd let them inside before using his radio to summon up a crew of monsters from the cave to help him out. While the girl's enthusiasm in the castle quickly mellowed out, the old man was rather disappointed when I decided it was time to leave. He said he couldn't wait to bring his grandson here, though I warned him against it, considering that our guide had explained it was basically a trap for overconfident players. He said it wouldn't matter, since as long as they got into the castle, his grandson could probably take on anything that was sent their way. When we finally got back to the cave, it was already dark, and everyone seemed tired. I went into the records room and asked the guy inside if it would be alright for the old man and the girls to end their monster shift early. He said it wouldn't be a problem and I stepped back into the main room to tell them. The old man was pretty grateful, and he went off to find his grandson, who I suggested might be in the inn. The girls also decided they'd rather go back and play their characters than be monsters, and they decided to head back to the inn as well. About five minutes after they had gone, one ended up coming back, announcing that she'd rather go out as a monster with me a little while longer. I hadn't paid much attention to this girl, and in fact had a bit of trouble telling her apart from her friends. She had enough makeup that I couldn't tell if she was pretty or not, and her only real distinct characteristic was the way she shuffled her feet when she walked, with rapid little steps that I knew she was doing on purpose, but I had no idea why, though I really would have preferred going out by myself, or at least with one of the other guys in my crew. She didn't seem interested when I suggested that she go back to her friends. We went out again as skeleton nights though we moved a lot faster and somewhat more quietly than we had in the larger group. We would have moved in complete silence if it weren't for her cold manner of walking, though I'll admit she showed some pervasiveness by managing to keep up with me as I hustled along the roads, her feet moving at a ridiculously fast pace to make up for her tiny steps. Though it was dark, I could pride myself on my night vision, and I led the young girl expertly through the forest and along the roads picking paths she could get through relatively unobstructed. When I offered that we take a rest, she gladly accepted, and I realised that she was far more exhausted than she appeared. As she sat down in the grass, she was breathing somewhat hard, which had been drowned out while she was walking by the sound of her feet. I offered her the cup portion of my canteen, as I drank straight from it, and asked why exactly she had decided to come with me. She drank too quickly, coughing slightly, before answering that she really wanted to fight well, and she thought that she could learn from watching me, and that I could teach her. The other girls had planned to spend the rest of the night in the inn, role-playing as fortune tellers and bards, and she herself couldn't really sing too well, and she didn't play an instrument. She just wanted to be able to protect her friends as she needed to. I wasn't much in the mood to try and teach anyone anything, but I had no problem with her tagging behind me, if that's all she really intended to do. After it seemed like she was well rested, I started off at a brisk pace, with plans to head towards the castle once again. Before we arrived, there was a brief moment where I felt something. It might sound like I'm speaking purely from hindsight, but there was definitely an odd tension in the air, something that made me alert and anxious. The moment passed as I heard branches snapping and three men stepped out of the woods, each moving towards me with the intent to battle. The goth girl moved backwards her shuffling feet announcing that she wanted to run. While I knew that he couldn't take on all three of them at the same time, 
I still had some distance between us before I had to make my fight or flight decision. 